right, so Derek, thank you for allowing me to do this interview on you. Um, I'm so excited to get into the questions. Hope you are too. Yeah, it's my pleasure. <laughs> thank you for doing it. Like, seriously, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, so let's get into this. Um, where did you grow up and what was it like growing up in that area? Um, I grew up here in Brookhaven. So I um, was born in New Orleans and adopted at six weeks old and, and raised here in Brookhaven. And um, growing up was good, but different. And, and I don't know how to describe that to everybody. It had its really, really good points. You know, I, I, my parents were wonderful. My education was good. Like everything was great. Um, but there's a, a darker side to everything that's like that. And um, being different and, and growing up where I grew up was kind of a, a rough punch in the face a couple of times. And so it taught me to kind of hold back parts of myself, mm -hmm. uh, especially as I got older and got more apparent. But that, that, that was kind of like the, the good and bad. You know, you, you grow up in a tight-knit neighborhood where everybody knows each other. Um, a community like this is very supportive of one another, and they still, to this day, supportive. Like, it's a wonderfully supportive place. Mm -hmm. But also, when everybody's that involved in each other's lives, it's hard to separate and remember that people are people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's feelings. And the things that you talk about and the things that you damn might be several of your friends or family members or yeah. and so it's keeping that in mind but it's it's been like i said it was a wonderful childhood with some really weird painful memories oh gosh <laughs> oh. but i think that's everybody yeah. especially creatives because a lot of times we're misunderstood and we don't even understand ourselves mm -hmm. and so going through that process in a community like this mm -hmm. is also difficult you know, you're trying to conform to everyone else's wants for you at the same time trying to figure out what you could possibly want yourself while not even being a fully formed human being yet. Exactly. You know, so exactly. it's 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 interesting. Yeah. You said that very well. Like, I like <laughs> misunderstood is like the life of a creative. So, it is. Yeah. You know, and I couldn't have asked for more supportive people to be around me, but at the same time, it didn't protect me. Mm -hmm. You know, from a lot of things that that we struggle with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so remember, we got a bigger sheet of paper, but we want to be short side, short side, long side, long side. And I'm going to cover above, pull my tape, and then I'm going to tear. And just remember, you want to get about half that paper in the tape so when you hover above it you should be able to see the shadow of the paper and you want it to be about halfway through the tape and then when I do the top the other short side I'm going to attach it to the paper first and make sure to give it a little tug to take out any space that might be left behind make sure it's nice and taut Attach it to the tape, pull up, give it a gentle tug, tap down, and then attach. You can run your fingernails around it to get it to really stick to the edges. What were your first forays into the art world? Um, I, I don't ever remember a time where I wasn't drawing. You know, I can remember um, I won a local art contest drawing a raccoon in the first grade. Hmm. You know, and I, I remember that raccoon on that tree and how hard I worked on it. And, um, but shortly after that, I discovered comic books and I kind of dove into that world of comic books and um, artists like um, 
Jim Lee and uh, Todd McFarlane and you know they were coming out with Spawn and um, you know they were really focusing on this beautiful art that was working in with the X-Men series and so I studied those lines and I studied and I learned how to draw figures from that um, and comic book faces and if, every, <laughs> if anybody's drawn comic books and tried to make the leap from drawing comic book faces to realism oh wow <laughs> like I you, can't imagine you're part way there but then there's a lot that you've got to figure out you know mm -hmm. so it, it, it got me um, you know reproducing comics that I saw got me really far in my skill level mm -hmm. and you know from not being not having a real arts education um, and then in junior high um, I believe I was a junior, um, we found a local artist who taught at the public schools who was doing private lessons, mm -hmm. Vicki Land, and she gave me everything. You know, she taught me what formal art was, she taught me what different mediums were and how to work with them and how they play with each other, what color was and expressiveness. Um, and she gave me a good foundation to go to the local community college. Mm -hmm. And they, again, backed up on foundations. You know, I, I learned uh, a great skill of drawing from the repetitiveness and the, mm -hmm. the demands of drawing classes in college. Um, but then after two years of that, I kind of took off and left, left education for a while just to figure out who I was. Gotcha, gotcha. Um... What are some prominent elements in your art and why do they seem to show up consistently in your work? Mm -hmm. I think the, the largest prominent element in my art, um, especially now, which, you know, we, we talked about this briefly, but I, I haven't been able to show any work that I've worked on in the past six years because none of it is finished. <laughs> you know, all of it is in just kind of a state of... Um, pulling together, but mm -hmm. um, emotional connection, or at least my emotional connection, art for me, when I, um, when I got back into it, um, art was a way of going through and figuring out what I was feeling and putting a face to it so I could figure out how to properly express it. Mm -hmm. So I did a ton of portraits of women. I've always bonded with women and admired women and had a stronger connection to women than I have any anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so um, I took just hundreds of, of stock photos and you know photos of friends and this photographer had a stash of photos and they would give it to me and then there's found photos but anytime I would get in my head about an emotion I would just start running through the pictures until I found one. I'm like that's the feeling. That's on my face. That's right there right now. Let me see it. And by studying it longer, it was more of um, giving myself permission to access those emotions, mm -hmm. um, permission to be okay with actually having those emotions because of, again, the way we grow up, we grow up pretty tight. Like, yeah, you can have emotions, but they go to a limit. Mm -hmm. You don't express them in public. That's a little rude. You know, mm -hmm. there's the, a, a whole bunch of rules in, in our um, kind of the way we grew up. And so a, a large part of my early work was just figuring out what an emotion was at any given time. Um, and that evolved into using other people's emotions. So give me your story. Let me translate your story in some visual image. Maybe I can connect to it. Maybe somebody can connect to the art. Maybe somebody can connect to this, to that, to this. Mm -hmm. And feel that they're not so alone. You're not so alone. I'm not so alone. We feel these things together. We just don't talk about it. You know? <laughs> and so, and then the, the new phase of my work has really started going into um, more of a narrative of what I've felt in the past. It's really hard for me to talk about. It's really hard for people to talk about when you, when you pull up your history and, mm -hmm. and what you've gone through and uh, what you've learned about yourself, how you learned it, your experiences. Um, so playing with those um, moments in life that gave me pause of maybe I shouldn't be recognizing this about myself. Like I want to challenge my work to dive into the parts 
that I don't necessarily feel the most comfortable with mm -hmm. putting out there. Because that's where my growth will happen. And I know that. I gotta dig in there and get it. You know, so um, it's about being um, different in the South and the beautiful lush imagery and the, the greens that were, you know, surrounded by and cornfields and cotton fields and, 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 and dirt and soil and, you know, anywhere you spit you can get grass and trees. <laughs> you know, there's, there's just abundance of, of natural life everywhere. Um, but my personality and the things I love exist in a lot of the pop culture and a lot of the fantasy and so I'm bringing more of my pop side, pop side's kind of a weird way to put it, but I'm putting, I'm, I'm bringing more of my cultural context and my cultural spin on a southern image mm. you know and trying to combine those things and that's what a lot of my work it, that that's coming out right now is about okay so what are the things you're going to want to do is you're going to want to sit get comfortable a brush in your hand and just get kind of where you can reach everything and you don't feel like you're going to go around like this because as soon as we do our setup and you start painting, you don't need to move around a whole lot. So everybody look at the little pot. Now, as you're looking, I want you to aim to the right. Is that the same pot that we were just looking at? No. No. Okay, lean to the other side. Same pot? No. Nope. Leaning forward. Same pot? No. Any way back. Right? So everything you're doing is changing your point of view. So what led you to founding the Little Yellow Building? Um, I, 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 I don't know if I can work for anybody else anymore. <laughs> like yeah. um, Mississippi and Brookhaven provides an opportunity. Mm -hmm. where I can take a thing like art and teaching after school programs and teaching adults and, and small community classes and turn that into something sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do that all across the United States. You know, the, the, the means of living and what you have access to and the amount of money it all costs varies um, so, so widely that, that this, this place provides a unique opportunity for artists and entrepreneurs in general. That it's just a, a, you can make a little bit go a long way here. And so when I moved back, um, I first put out the, the little call on Facebook and said, who wants art classes? I'm gonna be teaching the summer I moved back in a friend's house, and it was my uncle's house. Um, and their, uh, their foyer, I set up a whole art class set up and, and had students and there was a good amount interested and it filled up my summer with students and um, I got the opportunity there was a, a location downtown and I was able to move my classes into there for about a year and at the end of that year we turned this little building it you know it was just kind of dilapidated and so we we rewalled it and made it something a little bit new and um, moved them in here and I've been here for now five years yeah, so it was, it, oh, I needed a way to create art and to be creative and to make a living from it because the other things that I were doing, I got to the point where I was considering it's just eating my time. Right. And how much time does, do we have left? Do any of us have left? It's, exactly. not, it's not given or promised. So no. what's in my way? What can I get rid of? And what can I do next? Well, what I like most about learning at the Little Yellow Building is Derek, of course, is very talented, but he's also uh, understanding with different personalities, and you know that because he teaches everybody from elementary school to older people like me. Uh, and also he steps us through, he, he increments us through the learning process where we don't get intimidated and yet I mean, I've, I feel like I've progressed significantly in the few months that I've been going here. Uh, 
And he jokes around a little bit too, he keeps it fun. Art makes me feel good about myself. I've wanted to, I did a little sketching when I was younger, but it was all on my own. I never took art classes, I always wanted to, and getting up there in years, so it's about time I did something about that. And I feel very privileged to have found the little yellow building so close to where I live. Uh, really, it's a meditation for me. When I'm in here, I just kind of zone out and uh, relax. Seriously, it's just like doing one of those meditation or yoga classes, except I'm making something at the same time. <laughs> Lou Yellow Building, uh, I work at Kapaya Lincoln Community College and the art instructors there had recommended me that I come to visit Derek and first day I met him, I knew that I'd learn a lot and I knew that he put up with my little bit of shenanigans <laughs> and that we get along well. I mean, when you're, when you're learning art, you gotta feel relaxed, you gotta get along well with your instructor, and I think Derek's the kind of guy who can get along with anybody. You've made a big impact in the arts community here in Mississippi by providing opportunities for other artists to showcase their work. Um, can you tell us a little about your past exhibitions, your magazine, your podcast interviews? Can you dig into that a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, I think ben, Big Impact is, is extremely gracious. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so moving back, we did the, I, I opened the school. I needed a place to create art and I had a place to teach. And then um, I had always had it in my mind that I wanted to play with the other artists in the state. And I still do, like that's, that's a big part of, of what I wanna do while I'm here. And when the pandemic happened and I didn't have anything else to do, it was a perfect opportunity to kind of reach out and start playing with other artists. Um, and, and so there came the podcast um, where I was reaching out and talking and interviewing and just finding about the lives. Like what, what made you you and how do you live every day? I'm so curious about that. And you know that, that was wonderful and the, the magazine came out of that where I was collecting all of these stories and I have access to all of these Mississippi artists and I want to put together these things. And so I did that and we released issue one. Um, and then started the call for issue two. And everything kind of hit ahead mm -hmm. last year and it became too much for me. Um, I had lost my grandmother who was kind of the biggest light in my life and didn't deal with it. I just piled on more work so I could go faster and not deal with it. And by the end of summer when things were calming down, um, my brain kind of just exploded and said, no more, we're not going to do any of that anymore. <laughs> yes. um, you're just going to stand here for a while and not, not, not know what you're going to do. Um, but all of that is archived now and I've, I've, I've got all of this information still that I was collecting. You know, I've got these stories and this art and all of this stuff still that, that I was collecting at the time. And so I've got to figure out a way to get that out there. Mm -hmm. um, but. You know, all of that stuff came from this really unique moment in time where the world stopped and I had the availability to be able to do it before I burned myself doing it. Yes. Doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was pre-warned and I knew, I already knew that I was going to burn out. You know, and and uh, when I meet new artists and talk to new people, they're like, wow, you're doing a lot. And I get to <laughs> it's gonna hit me at some point. I'm gonna hit a wall, but how do you stop until you do that? Um, so now I have kind of stripped back everything, um, focusing on the kids, focusing on classes and what I can accomplish locally uh, before I kind of go back out and, and start doing shows and stuff like that again. It just, I, I, I wasn't sustainable doing it all. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense at all, it makes, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it makes complete. Sense. I mean, when you when you open your computer and you know you've got an email and you 
pull up your email and then you can't figure out how to type words wow. like you can't remember it your oh, brain is just wow. too fried that is that's you know it. and so I, I just had to stop yeah. <laughs> oh wow okay yeah understand <laughs> Uh, so what I'm working on right now is a piece for the Historical Society, the Lincoln County Historical Society. Um, every year since I've moved back, I've been honored to be asked to create a piece of art based on a local location um, for, that's going to be turned into the Christmas ornament. And they'll start selling these uh, in October, I believe, and they'll sell them through Christmas. And yeah, so this is the sixth one I've been doing. And you can see... Kind of my process is messy. I like to use golden open paints. They dry a little slower. Okay. So it lets me create these thin layers that are really washy. They send me the picture references that I can use. And then like I took this and I found another photo online that had some wonderful shadows that I'm using in my take. So I'll kind of combine different photos, take the best of what I need. Um, so this little collection of paintings, I have I, I, all the paintings that I keep up in the studio, I keep for demonstration purposes, basically. There'll come a point in time when I need to point out what we're actually talking about so you can understand it a little better. Uh, but there are actual works that I loved and created. Um, this one up here is an example of something that's a lot more messy, uh, a lot more... Um, improvisational, lots of brush strokes, messy chunks. You can see the water layers that I used. Mm -hmm. Thinning out paint is a big technique of mine. I love glazing because I like the ability to see through color. And these kind of represent that. And then, you know, these are, these are paintings that I found um, reference images for that really matched my emotions at the time. And then this painting kind of marked a shift for me into finding and creating images to fill the narrative that I wanted to tell. Um, and so this one's titled Around Seven, and it just talks about, you know, getting crushed at around seven years old. There's beauty and fun, and you don't see it until you see it. <laughs> you haven't always lived in Mississippi. Can you go into other places you have been to with your art and how it compares to where you are now? Yeah. Um, so after, after Mississippi, I moved to Orlando, Florida, and I've lived there, or I lived there on and off for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, my first time in Orlando was, uh, I think the closest I got to art was I managed a sports photography company hmm. uh, for a little bit at a Disney Wide World of Sports, and that was fun. You know, we did framing and all that. So, yeah, it's, it's close enough to art where I could say it's art related. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, I didn't get back into um, visual arts and creativity until I went to culinary school. And I went to Le Cordon Bleu and got my pastry degree and started making all of these like, beautiful little desserts. And um, while I was working, it was a big benefit to me that I would be interviewing you for a wedding cake. And while you're telling me all your hopes and dreams, I'm sketching out your cake right there with a visual rep representation that I'm capable of recreating. Mm -hmm. you know? And so by the end of us talking, I was able to say, this is what you want? And they're like, oh my God, it's a, yeah, and it's so just cool. the beautiful moments. And, um, and that reminded me of how much I love to draw because then I started just drawing all these wild cakes that would never be created. <laughs> and then, you know, what can I make a cake do? And then I remembered how much I loved comic books. And so I went back to drawing comic book characters and I was so much better at it than I was when I was little, you know? So it's like fed into that, oh, I can do this. Um, and it, by the time um, I moved back to Florida the second time, um, art was, art was really starting to surface in my life and I had to find a way to, to start producing. Mm -hmm. um, so I took uh, service industry gigs. I started bartending. It would, you know, give me money-making time at night and then 
during the day I became kind of like a student in my own house. Mm -hmm. I went and studied art history, I would watch endless videos on techniques, I would anything that would pop into my head, I would immediately go study it and fall mm -hmm. down the rabbit hole of every <laughs> single subject and just devour as much information as I could. Um, and then I started giving myself challenges or you know, now what I would consider my elementary lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, I would come up with these little challenges for myself and put them all in a jar and then when I needed something to do, I'd pull something out of the jar. And it was like I was being, I was in class again. Right. Like you that... had to complete the assignment. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so at that point, it didn't matter how good it was or how bad it was, I had to complete the assignment. Mm -hmm. I had to figure out how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so that really got me back into creating and that led me into painting the women, which led me into painting the next thing, you know, and kind of built from there. Cool, cool. So, um, have you ever faced any type of resistance in your efforts as an artist? I think more from myself than, than anyone else. Like when I have the idea, I, I will run scenarios of rejection through my head before I even complete the idea. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a human nature. And that's me second guessing myself on anything I want to do. Um, I think the, uh, I had a little bit of resistance. I had a show uh, about a year, a little over a year ago um, here in Mississippi. And it had to do with um, iconic queer portraits and somebody pitched a little bit of a fit about some of the drag queens and so some of those you know had to come down uh, but I mean it is what it is mm -hmm. if, if I don't do what I'm gonna do then you don't have the option to have the opinion right you know, I, you'll never know what you think and I'll never know what you think and I'll never know how the world reacts if I don't just create it and put it out there so um, negative reaction or not I think it's more important for me to just try mm -hmm. a little bit and, and, and figure it out later. <laughs> <laughs> right, deal with the, the Go to therapy. Lashley. Like yeah. it's. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's this tan that's underneath there that's the actual color of the vase. But if you look in the shadows, it looks like there's some kind of bluish in this tan where the shadow's falling. Um, it doesn't exist here or here where the light's strongly hitting it. Then we've got this copper brown color and these golden colors. And like, there's a lot of colors to this. So you've got kind of these dirty tones and greens back here, and then you've got a different darker green right there. And then lime green on the edges of those. So I, in order to get these started, I'm just gonna kind of pick a place I'm comfortable with. And one is like high-fiving right now. That big weed is saying, start with me, start with me. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out because those are pink leaves with white. So I'm going to go ahead and I've got some pink started. I'll add a little bit of white to that to loosen it up. On the other side, I'm going to add a little extra red. Okay. I like working with looser paints, but you don't have to. You can work with these pretty thick if you want to. Mm -hmm. We'll start, there's that pedal, there's that pedal. Let's take a little white, take it to the top of that. I've already got white, on, I mean pink on my brush, so, so boom, I have a pedal. Okay, let's move on to this pedal. A little bit of extra red there. I'm going to come darker red on the edge of that petal. Notice that the, the brush strokes that I'm making, A, I'm holding it from way back here. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying just off the bat of holding it so far back to not have so much control because I know I'm capable of going in and getting a really good blend if I want it. Not the point of this. What made you add water to it? Because I liked it. That's the only reason. If you find that you like the, the feel of that thick paint a lot better, use it. Use it thick. I don't. 
I like the glide. I like how far the paint can spread. Yeah. But I have to go over it in many layers because I use my paint so thin. So, I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit for <laughs> a, a bit, for a moment. Um, do you have any human rights issues that are close to you and have you been personally affected by any? Um, okay, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that affects me most is uh, some of what I'm seeing that's happening now mm -hmm. and it's it's a repeat everything's on repeat the the actions um, the the rejection the the public standing of, of somebody's identity mm. you, know, you have no right nobody has a right over anyone else's identity, over anyone else's anything. That's another human being. It's not you, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, that's a big issue for me. And in in a place Mississippi, in a place like Mississippi, we care, and sometimes we hurt through caring. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we don't mean to. Um, you're loving that person in your own way, but you're not realizing how much you're hurting that person. Mm -hmm. um, or you don't even realize that person is who they are. You know, that's just an opinion you hold and you didn't realize that the people closest to you would be affected by the things that you say or the, the things that you do. Um, it's an issue for me. And the... The, I lived in Orlando for a long time mm -hmm. and I bartended and one of the bars that I bartended at was sister to Pulse Nightclub and I had moved three months before the shooting occurred and if anybody even remembers that anymore there were 49 people that died that night um, many more that were hurt, but it was useless, pointless, pointless, pointless tragedy. And, you know, I couldn't be there. I was, I was a million miles away, you know, in which, you know, what would have happened if I would, nothing, nothing would have been any different if I'd been there. You know, this is not, this is, had nothing to do with me, but I recognized those faces. I had served those people. I knew several of their drinks by heart. And a couple of a couple of friends, but you know, no real close acquaintances. I was I was lucky in that, you know, the people I was closest to either made it out or they weren't there that night or that wasn't their night to go. Um, but it's all because somebody didn't think somebody else should exist. Mm -hmm. you, you have no right to say any of that, especially if you believe in what you say you believe in because right. then we were all created. Right. You know, then I, so I, I don't know how close to human rights stuff that, that goes, but you know, we're, we're at a point where we're doing it to another community just because they can't fight back and we need a target in order to gain momentum and and watching people build their careers off of hateful hateful things is really hard when you know people that are truly affected by this stuff
So, switching gears. <laughs> on a brighter Let's note. talk about cubbies now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right now, your focus is on passing along your knowledge to the kids and adults that come here um, to help hone their talents. Um, so, how did you get reacquainted with that and back involved with education after everything you've been through? I didn't want to. I didn't know I would. <laughs> that's, that's a different thing. I never thought I would be teaching anybody anything. Um, I was asked, you know, uh, and I had a friend um, named Tracy and her son Sage needed art lessons when I was in Florida and I did it privately and when I got here I was like, you know, it could be something that I could do. And we have Mississippi School of the Arts here, so you know people in the community know how important art is. Um, but they serve the state of Mississippi. So what if I can come in and serve Lincoln County? Or what if I can come in and serve Brookhaven on a smaller level, um, and just start getting them geared up for going into MSA or not going into art at all? Like we talk about that so much in class. Like how you can come into art class and you don't have to go home and be a painter. You know, it's more about unleashing and protecting your creativity and not losing it and learning how to exercise it and, and come up with idea after idea after idea. Because at the end of the day, when they go into the workforce, if they're the ones with ideas, they're some of the most important people in the room. Mm -hmm. And if they can outthink everyone else, you can. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it's a flexible muscle that you can work and you can just start coming up with random ideas that will blow people's minds. Exactly. But you have to protect that and you can lose it very easily. You know, so we not only focus on technique in here, but it's a lot about being okay with your ideas and seeing something through no matter how dumb you might think it is or how unperfect, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a YouTuber that I kind of took his phrase from, um, but he says that it's always about progression over perfection because perfection doesn't exist. Oh, and I'm just yeah. like, oh, I gotta oh, use yeah. that for the rest of my life. <laughs> I, I love think his that. name is Matt Walsh. He's a makeup YouTuber out of I all things. That. You know, he talks about skincare <clears throat> and he's and and you know the what he's saying is about your appearance you know your your skin you know go for progression get better don't worry about being perfect perfect every time but it translates so well to the way we feel about what we're creating mm -hmm. you know you're so involved with what's in front of you and you become emotionally connected to the lines that you're making yeah. and if they're not perfect then it's it's heartbreaking and destroying and when you come into a place like this, like we're all about class and having you know, lessons and building on techniques. So it's very important to remember that what you're doing now is practice and fun. Mm -hmm. And if we need to sit down and have a one-on-one, -on -one, like long time, here's a masterpiece that we're producing, then we can do that too. Mm -hmm. But this is not that. You know, this is coming in and not stifling yourself and trying to let yourself be as free as possible and being around other creatives and other people that are interested in what you're interested in. It all feeds off of each other. Yeah, I love that. Um, you, you have a special initiative going on to pour into the kids here. Can you tell us more about that? So it's, it's something that's getting started. It's called the Arts and Entrepreneurship Club. And um, I want to bridge some of the gaps of what I struggled with. You know, I struggled with, I could make art all day long, but what do you do after you make art? Yes. You know, what do you do when you have a great idea? And you know, how do you release a product? How do you do all of these things that you should just know in general for business as a creative, because we do produce so many ideas, you should know how to bring them to market and you should know how to cost them and how to make a profit off of them. Even if it's something like lessons, you know, lessons and teaching are entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so, um, I wanted to start bridging that gap young. Um, not in a 
I don't want to put the obsession of money in their heads, but I want them to have a feeling of security going forward in life, yeah. knowing that at any point in time they can pick up a bunch of random objects and make something and sell it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, believe it or not, it takes a long time for that to sink in and click and you're like, look, oh my God, I can do that. Yeah. <sighs> if only I would have known that 15 years ago. Yes. You know, and I've said that to myself so many times. And so those lessons, the 15 years ago lessons, are what I bring into a lot of the Arts and Entrepreneurship Club. And um, we were, it's, it's in its first year, it's in beta, you know, it's, it's a beta program. Yeah. Um, what I did was uh, start off with my high schoolers last year, just the regular high school class, and we went through and studied like, what makes an icon, you know, a logo, and what makes uh, a package, and what makes a product design, and what makes sourcing products, and you know, they got to come up with their own ideas and design their own ideas and come up with packaging and slogans and a marketing plan and it worked it was fun you know it's, a, it's something that you can have a lot of fun with mm -hmm. but um, but it's something that at the end of the day will always be there for them to pull up again and up again and up mm -hmm. again and if you find yourself in 15 years where you're like mm, I have an idea maybe you had a lesson in life that helps you bring that idea to fruition mm -hmm. and that's kind of the idea behind the arts and entrepreneurship club and i love that you're doing that because artists that's a big thing that we struggle with because we have the creativity stuff down pat but it's that business stuff and it mm -hmm. takes like you say it's a huge learning curve and a something that you have to adapt to and not think that, oh, I'm not an artist because I'm involved in this business aspect. Like It goes hand in hand. Yeah. So that I think that's a really great program that will have a good impact on the kids that come through it. I hope so. I hope so. It'll be, it, it'll be fun. Yeah. If nothing else, it'll if be nothing fun. Else. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, also, I, I heard that you have a, a fundraising event coming up. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so it's, it's actually part of the Arts and Entrepreneurship Program. You know, we, I talked about the high schoolers and they went through creating their own products. Um, I needed a way for all of us to study the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, so we came up with the idea of cotton candy and I went and found a source for flavors and printed out you know, a booklet of flavors and they could go through and their challenge was that you could combine any flavors out of the whole thing but it had to make a new flavor. So if you found pie dough and you found apples and you found whipped cream, then you could make apple pie a la mode but you had to rename it, mm -hmm. you had to come up with the idea and the concept and then um, they had to come up with a logo for their own flavor, you know, so. And then we actually got the sugar in and, uh, and the cotton candy machine in and we mixed all our own sugars and tasted it and went through the whole process of making it. And so um, with that, we're, we're taking those flavors and November 4th, I believe, is National Candy Day. Okay. And for that day, I'm turning this place into a candy shop with a photo you know, opportunity and stuff like that, with a, a, a cotton candy machine in the back, and we're gonna sell pre-orders for all the things that the, um, the kids created. And we've got like, one is called Sticky Fingers, and it's, it sh when sh they were imagining it, um, all they wanted was like, or all they could describe was the bottom of your grandmother's purse. You know, so there's like this sticky candy that was for that child, and this sticky candy, like if you just stick your head in there and sniff, it's like this overwhelmingly sweet candy thing. And, and they did it, you know, they found this grape soda flavor, and they found this tutti frutti flavor, and they found this flavor, and they put it all together, and it's the bottom of your grandmother's purse, and it doesn't taste great, but it's, it's what it is. It's yeah, so hilarious. Yeah, that's great. Oh my goodness. Table. 
When Betsy comes back, can we do this one again? Mm -hmm. That made that face look a little bit more right? mm -hmm. I need stronger whites. That's what I've lost in mind. Uh, this edge could be brighter white. The back of this could be brighter white. There's lots in here. And some of this that could be pale down. Um, I muted out some of my whites on my flowers. I'm not going to think too much about it. I'm good with what I've got. So I've got two more questions for you. What is your vision for the future of your practice? I think right now is just providing more is all I really want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, but the, the fundraising is in order to buy eight iPads, you know, so every student in here can come in and work digitally. You know, that's a big part of our market now is being able to work digital and send, you know, those files and, and they need to know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Starting young, they need to know how to, to do it. Um, there's also the matter of, you know, ex expanding this location. You know, I have a, um, a storage facility in the back, and it's just storage right now. But if I can go in and create a room, then I can add a kill, and then I can teach pottery too. Yeah. You know, there's all of these things that could be taught. I just don't necessarily have the space or the materials right now to do it. So I think that that's all I'm really focused on right now, is just more stuff for the kids to be able to, to do and grow with. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and last question. <clears throat> what are ways you think we can improve opportunities available to artists? That's a hard question because I've watched, I've watched, you know, things. Not in the past year. I've been off of social media and off of pretty much everything in the past year. Um, I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, but I think building larger networks of, of um, available artists, of artists that are you know, located in your area. Um, because if someone in that network gets wind of an opportunity and can spread it across the network, that might help a little. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm seeing that's kind of a little bit stifling for us is we're just not getting the information. You know, or we're getting it two days before deadlines, or um, 
or in the case of our grant system, like where's a walkthrough? You know, where's the actual information? Because it's it's a little complicated. Yeah. And it, especially if you've never done anything like that before, it's it gets very very intimidating. Mm -hmm. So it's not just here's all the things you need to fill out, but let us help you. You know, let us let us. Uh, here's a video of me pointing out. You know, click this and and it. it I, I joke around with students where I'm like, okay, we're gonna take the elementary version, I'm gonna show you how to tear tape. Mm -hmm. And I know you're adults, but just let's do this and show them how to tear tape. And they're like, oh. And it's, it's not, <laughs> they knew how to tear tape before, but it was uh -huh. just learning how to tear this tape in this, this way. Yeah. You know, in this context. And you know, people know how to write and they know how to come up with numbers and they know how to how to build the ideas in their head and to talk them out with people, but they don't necessarily know that they're doing all of that. You kind of have to let them know, oh yeah, that's the information that you put right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that, that idea, what you just said, is the information you put right here. Right. You know, because that was, that, I think that that's one of the, the bigger hindrances that we have. It's just a lack of, of communication and network across each other because there are networks like we have networks but I just don't think we have one big network to look to if that makes sense okay okay cool Derek thank you so <laughs> much this has been a pleasure yeah, talking you. with you and getting to know more about you thank you oh, yes all right <laughs> and so that that's it sweet